Okay, we are live. Thank you very much, Liron, for joining the Magic Internet Money Podcast. Uh, is it Shapira? Is that how you pronounce your last name? Yeah, Liron Shapira. My pleasure, Brad. Liron Shapira. So, just to set this up for people that may not know who you are, or um, wonder what you know, I've seen maybe some of your Bitcoin tweets and wondering why I want to talk to you so much. Um, I've been following you for probably like a year and a half maybe two years from the really hilarious videos that you sh that you create that takes VCs at their own words and just plays it and lets them dig their own graves as to why they are building Ponzi schemes that have no use cases. And you, you mean like I've been, a, I've been called the Peter Schiff of DeFi and you know, the crypto Peter Schiff and these things like the Nuriel Rabini of crypto, because I'm a, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm very much, into bitcoin for reasons about you know sound money and freedom of speech and things like that and um i just do i dove down the rabbit hole of crypto and i just got so triggered every cycle when bitcoin starts to go on this uh, price run and mass adoption cycle you end up getting all these grifters coming in and bastardizing the legitimate use case of of bitcoin as just a money and it's not trying to be anything other than that then getting people claiming to use the blockchain for all these crazy things, including well, new ways to earn and new ways to er get yield and invest and track your dog walks and all these different things. And so I've been very critical, but I saw you start posting maybe two years ago. I started watching some of the videos you're posting and seeing your tweets. I'm like, oh man, this guy's like the Grim Reaper of Web3. This is amazing. It's so funny. He's <laughs> like a tactical surgeon going in there and just dissecting all these Ponzi schemes from all these Shilicoin Valley VCs that are just blatantly out there building Ponzi's and pu pumping billions of dollars into them and trying to pretend like it's the evolution of the internet. So very happy to have you come on the podcast and kind of touch on the Web3 stuff, the Shillicoin Valley schemes, and also lately following your takes on AI, which to me, I've kind of gotten a little bit scared of what might come with AI, uh, just the chaos that might come over the next year or two based on these like uh, agents and stuff being just set loose on us and disrupting everything. So you've moved on from being like the Grim Reaper of Web3 to being the AI doomsayer. So <laughs> great, great to have you on. And thanks for, for all your hilarious content and prescient warnings and stuff that you've been doing about crypto, Web3, and now <laughs> AI. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, you know, it's it's been fun to, to see kind of like what we consider the top VCs kind of reveal that in many ways their thought process is just like not competent. Uh, it was weird. It started for me in 2021 when I started getting the idea myself, like, hey, all this all this Web3 stuff, you know, besides Bitcoin, all these things that people are pitching that the blockchain can do, have they really thought this through? Like, are the use cases really there? So I started getting skeptical. And then um, the, the triggering moment for me was when I went on Twitter and I saw the threads that were being published by Chris Dixon, right? Because he was getting a lot of credit for these viral threads where he was teaching people these mental models. So I read the threads with much interest, right? And like the thread that really kind of made me realize, wait a minute, like the emperor has no clothes thread for me <laughs> happened to be the one where he talked about um, web three, uh, your margin is my opportunity. So like web two is all about like having overly fat margins. And in web three, the margins are going to be smaller and everybody's going to be happier. And I'm like reading through this thread and I'm like, wait a minute, this is like failing like econ 101 i mean these are logically incoherent ideas that he's pitching like he hasn't even thought through what he's trying to explain to other people and it's it's very emperor has no clothes because everybody you know crypto was pumping web3 was pumping and everybody was being like oh my god chris this is like brilliant like everybody follow chris's ideas and i'm like well wait a minute you're saying stuff like hey spotify is taking an overly high take rate Spotify is not even a profitable company. Like, wh where are you seeing an overly, <laughs> where are you seeing an overly high take rate for Spotify? And how do you think that blockchain technology helps Spotify charge less? So, so that was the moment for me. I'm like, oh my god! Like, some of these VCs, you know, I, and I used to have a lot of respect for these VCs, and I, I still do to some degree. Like, I me still too. think that many VCs are smart people, but there was very much like, you know, it kind of revealed who was swimming naked, where the fact that these coins were pumping kind of made it okay for them to just release all this bad logic out on Twitter, right? To like write all these incoherent threads. And so I, I basically spotted like an arbitrage opportunity where I'm like, wow, uh, there's not really anybody on Twitter, like within the VC and startup community, just calling out 
like you said, in the VC's own words, just kept picking apart their own words and being like, hey, look, everybody, it's a naked emperor. <laughs> yeah, it's like their, their incoherence is your opportunity to get some followers on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> well said, well said. But it was, uh, yeah, it was for me too, like this last bubble caused me to lose the most amount of respect I've ever had lost for people I used to respect. Uh, anybody that made it through this last crypto bubble without shilling their own NFT series or investing in a Web3 scheme or launching their own scheme to like scam their audience out of what, what little money they had left after the friggin inflation rates went through the roof. It, it it's it's very rare to find somebody that didn't participate in that. And so anybody that didn't participate in it or actively turned it down or asked the right questions like, hey, how is this not a scam? <laughs> or, hey, how is this right. not breaking securities rules? Um, they got my respect. But people like Tim Ferriss and Kevin Rose and all these Silicon Valley VCs that I used to kind of look up to as an aspiring entrepreneur when I was younger 10 years ago, listen to their podcasts and kind of like read their books and shit. Like these guys are just grifters. They're they're just trying to make as much money as they possibly can with no ethics behind it and very little thought to how these utility token narratives are just like bunk logic. So yeah, you're, it was a real treat following your tweets um, for the last for the last little while. So thank you for that entertainment yeah, and but... uh, being a sound of reason. You know. Yeah. Um... No, I, I apologize. I mean, I'm glad it's resonating with some people. Um, I think calling them grifters, I mean, there's no doubt there's so many grifters in crypto, but if you look at the kind of people that I have a lot of respect for, you know, like Naval Ravikant, even Tim Ferriss, um, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, I, I really, it's hard to have respect for them now because they've conducted themselves, you know, very immorally in many ways. So I, I've certainly lost respect for them, but I don't know if I'd go so far as to call them grifters um, because... I do think that they're sold on their own ideas. So I don't think that in their mind, they're like, oh yeah, you know, crypto, it doesn't really make sense, but let me just like pump while I still can. Um, I don't think there's that much of that. I think that they're used to matching patterns in tech, right? Where in tech, when you see a graph going up, you really are supposed to just kind of, you know, suspend your disbelief and pray that it'll go up more. And even if you're wrong 99% of the time, right, you're going to have these massive upsides. Like that's just how you do your job in tech, right? So it's, I wouldn't really call that a grift because tech is an engine of value creation. It only becomes a grift or it only becomes value destructive when you're running into one of these trends and the source of the trend isn't actually a new use case or a new valuation, uh, value creation, but it's a Ponzi scheme. Right, so the Ponzi scheme is camouflaged as a tech but that, dude. And, like that's yeah. the thing. Like, how could they possibly not know that what they were promoting was was going to yeah. get everybody following them absolutely financially ruined, and mm -hmm. potentially get them sued and and lead people down a path of just nonsense? Like that's the that's the mm -hmm. way I think it's grifting because these people are so smart in other areas and they th seem very thoughtful. So the fact that like they're disconnecting the ethics from the like money making side of it because it's like a tech trend that they can capitalize on to me that really makes me think it's grifting because they they're smart enough to know that this stuff is all ponzi scams and it doesn't yeah. make any sense so i i agree that they should know better right like it is their job like it is chris dixon's job to look at axie infinity and notice that the reason why people are playing the game is because new players give them money, right? Like it is Chris Dixon's <laughs> job to draw a diagram on the whiteboard and notice that it's shaped like a Ponzi, like that scene in the office, right? Where Michael Scott is like drawing the, the triangle, <laughs> right? Like that is, yes, I agree it is his job. I agree he should be fired. I agree that LPs should not let him raise another fund. So to some degree, there is that level of responsibility. Uh, but um, it is kind of hard. I mean, the thing is I see in the startup world that there's another element to this that doesn't get discussed enough. It's kind of my contribution to this discourse, which is, the idea of a hollow abstraction, right? So, so it's the idea of like, you can throw around big words that sound really inspiring. Like one of the best ones is, you know, composability, right? Like Web3 <laughs> is all about composability. And, and of course they have other ones. They talked about low margins um, and they talked about ownership, right? Like, mm -hmm. isn't it great if these companies can foster more ownership? And you can try to argue with the abstractions. You can try to be like, no, we should have less ownership. We should, we should rent things more. Or you can be like, hey, we should have less composability. We should have less decentralization. We should have more, de more centralization. But that's actually, um, th that's kind of a fool's path to try to take the abstraction and be like, no, let's have the opposite abstraction. 
That's not what I would do. I don't think that the abstractions are fundamentally wrong. I think that they're hollow, right? Mm -hmm. So I think when, when you say, hey, uh, you know, all this Web3 stuff is decentralization, I don't think decentralization is bad. I think that in practice, you're not actually describing a specific system that promotes ownership. You're not actually describing a specific totally. system that's more decentralized. You're just kind of hand-waving, saying, like, wouldn't it be nice if we had more ownership? And it never and maps to, yeah. <laughs> And what they've ended up building is not decentralized. They ended up using right. decentralization as a shield to shield Ponzi scheme tokens. But what they've done is they've recreated Web 2, but just slapped tokens on top of it and made the user experience worse. It's like a higher barrier to entry. And then they mm -hmm. go and they shill Web 3 ideas like ownership and disintermediating the middleman when they become the middleman and they, they profit. So it goes from Web 2 is you are the product to Web3 is you're the exit liquidity for the VCs <laughs> pre-mining this stuff. It's not mm -hmm. really the like the the internet evolution of the future. It's just another, it's hard for me not to use the word grift because like I feel like not only is it a grift, but it's an unethical pump and dump because the flywheel that they create, like A16Z and Susquehanna and Sequoia and all these VCs in the Valley, they first of all they had a banking license with silicon valley bank to a license to actually print money and issue loans so from the federal reserve they're authorized to actually create money from nothing so that's one way that they go and they they give low interest like z zero interest rate loans to founders and funds and that goes into investing into web3 ponzi scheme coins and then they take their funds and they put them into the liquidity protocols like the lp token pools where you pair up ethereum with usdc and then that issues more tokens that's the whole thing that keeps the, the ponzi's running that like we're not we're not doing an unregistered security offering because we're not selling you anything you're we're just putting money into a smart contract that we built and we run and we put on coinbase and, <laughs> and we market but we're not doing an unregistered securities offering so to me right. it's like man this whole thing is like worse than what wall street did it's worse than just promoting some bad bunk logic that's hollow because they're actually pumping and dumping and market making like they're mixing mm -hmm. what the the function of wall street was with the function of silicon valley like the venture capital and then the liquidity into the markets they're doing it all mm -hmm. and it's all based on ponzinomics and then you know the whole thing blows up unsurprisingly but more hilariously is it doesn't seem like anybody's got any in any trouble. It doesn't seem like there's been any yeah. reconciliation. They didn't acknowledge that they did this. It's like they're still shilling this dumb bunk logic still. Right. I, I think you're making two interesting points. Um, and in addition to your point about like the financial shenanigans and the, uh, the selling securities, um, I also want to revisit your first point, which I think is very interesting, which is like you look at these Web3 projects and there's so much Web2 to them, right? It's like, <laughs> like, yeah, we just optimize this. It's like, okay, yeah, we do have a database. We do have a server. Like we do have a Discord, right? So it's like you have all these Web2 elements. We have a company. We're registered. Right, we have a company. We're, we're doing KYC exactly. AML checks. Exactly, right. And, and, and we have VC funding, right? <laughs> the VCs are getting stock, you know, and tokens, but they're also getting stock. Yeah. Um, so they have all these Web2 elements and you always want to ask the question like, wait, so which part is supposed to be the Web3, right? And normally the way that you build tech, especially new tech, is there is something to be said for like, okay, you have the small Web3 part, like you have the critical part that you need to be Web3 and then it's okay to use Web2 around it. Like you, you have to optimize, like that's fine. It's okay to, you know, a minimal viable product can be a lot of Web2. That would normally be my attitude, but the Web3 part is always totally unnecessary. Like it's, so it's, the whole thing is basically just like a LARP. It's just like they want to stick the label totally. Web3 on it. I mean, just one example, you know, Farcaster, which is basically a Twitter clone. It's funded by A16Z to the tune of uh, $30 million. Uh, they, they led the round. Farcaster, they even explicitly say, look, we want it to be Web2 as much as possible. We're only going to do Web3 for the part that needs to be Web3. And what is the part that needs to be Web3? The Username allocation has to be an <laughs> NFT. You need an L NFT to claim. There's no other way to claim a username except to have an NFT. That's why we need blockchain technology. It's like, are you kidding me? What, when has that ever been a problem on the web, username allocation? They're going to store all the likes in the blockchain. It's great. 
So, well, in the case of Farcaster, they're actually, it's kind of like an RSS protocol. They're like, yeah, well, it's, it's actually very much like a Noster or like a Mastodon. So most of it is actually Web2 and it's like, fine, it's an interesting experiment. Like I have nothing against Mastodon. I do have something against acting like this is Web3 when you just yeah. want to allocate your usernames as an NFT. It's like, are you kidding me? If Farcaster so succeeds, it's pretty clear that they're going to just also let you allocate usernames more efficiently if that's what you want to do. Like you don't actually need the NFT part. Like it's not even a Web3 company. So the other thing too about Farcaster I saw recently just because I was following your Twitter and you you were talking about them is like right on their right on their Twitter profile it says a sufficiently decentralized social network. <laughs> They're basically trying to like preemptively program whoever at the SEC is looking at their token to say, oh it's a sufficiently decentralized Web three thing. It's not an unethical uh, pump and dump illegal security mm -hmm. it's sufficiently decentralized got it so they're, they're like i think a lot of these people are aware that maybe what they did was unethical and they're kind of getting away with it because after the collapse of ftx and celsius and three arrows capital and all these different big ponzi's that were shilled by all of these influential uh people whether it's Ral Paul from Real Vision or Mike Novogratz or Andreessen Horowitz, Chris Dixon, some cases Balaji and Tim Ferriss and even people that aren't so much like launching this bullshit, but promoting it. And maybe they're probably in the pre mine. Like, I think a lot of these guys, Tim Ferriss, Kevin Rose, all these guys I used to look up to a lot. Like, I mean, I was uh, obsessed with Tim Ferriss's stuff for a long time, but then, you know, kill your heroes, I guess, because it turned out that he was you know, pre -mi getting into the pre-mines of all these crappy projects and sort of promoting this idea. And then people like him, who you look at as like an ethical person who's a bastion of morals in the space or whatever, is putting 3-3 in his, in his Twitter tag and tweeting GM and stuff like that. And, you know, like, it just, to me, seems like there's definitely a point at which it feels like there's been an erosion of ethics in the Valley because of this crypto stuff and it, it seems to have exposed a lot of people who i don't know if it's just they are bad at thinking long term or they are just dumb like i don't know what you think about this like you seem to be not as hard on people like tim ferris and stuff like that as i am and i'm not like that hard on them i just i'm disappointed mostly what it is i'm very yeah. disappointed I mean, Tim Ferriss, he, you know, he has been a successful angel investor. So I, I do think he did uh, screw up a little bit, you know, getting into these pre-mines of these things that were essentially just Ponzi's. But it's like, look, who among us hasn't, uh, you know, got tried to get in early to some kind of scheme? I mean, I personally, full disclosure, um, I was actually an angel investor in Coinbase back in 2012. When really? I thought, yeah, I, I thought what I was investing in was the number one Bitcoin company. Right. Right. So you that's that's something that that you guys think is cool, right? I mean, back then, but like since the block size wars in 2017, it, it became pretty clear that Brian Armstrong was was not really on Team Bitcoin anymore. And he turned into more of like a, a crypto ICO Web3 DeFi guy and kind of linked up with A16Z and started that whole flywheel where Coinbase Ventures mm -hmm. would would facilitate like the creation of all these DeFi coins. And then they would do this thing called generalized mining with all the crypto VCs, where they literally described this in 2019 on some podcasts. I think it was Multicoin Capital was a, or Coin Fund or one of those guys that were on a podcast. And they were talking about how they're going to use, they were going to simulate usage of these blockchain networks to make it attract people to come look at it because they would say, Oh, well, this is we're, we're going to do generalized mining. It's mining 2.0. It's like Bitcoin mining, except we're just going to fake using it so that we can get a bunch of tokens and people get attracted by the returns and start using it. So literally, they're just talking about wash trading and pump and dumping. So, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's just, yeah, Coinbase has lost yeah. a lot of respect from Bitcoiners over the last five years. But I don't know what you think about Coinbase these yeah. days. <clears throat> I mean, I do think Coinbase has lost some dignity. Um, I think there's a lot to like about Brian Armstrong. You know, he's a talented founder. And I think in many ways, if you kind of put on the constraint that he still has to run Coinbase and he has to do something, <laughs> right? If, if, you, if, if you say, hey, he's not hitting the eject seat, he has to do something. You know, I kind of respect that he's like trying to make it work somehow, right? He's like, maybe this can work somehow. Let me do the best I can. If I were in his position, I'd be like, look, 
this isn't going to work, right? <laughs> like maybe I'll stick, maybe I'll stick to Bitcoin or maybe I'll just like shut it down, right? Like right. distribute the the assets to the investors like liquidation. Uh, but I respect that he wants to like keep trying to make it work, right? It's like, look, he basically wants to like pull a rabbit out of the hat. You know, he's going to be the captain to go down the ship. I mean, you know, I still, there's a lot to like about the guy and, you know, he seems like somebody who has integrity, you know, for his own values. So I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I'm still pretty pro Brian Armstrong, even though, I have a beef with Coinbase these days where it's like the tokens that they list, they're like, these aren't That's securities. That's the problem. Like these right. things it's like, are come all on, garbage. Brain trust token. There's so many tokens on Coinbase Student right now coin. that I'm like, yeah. <laughs> right. Because the, the thing is that the tokens that are on Coinbase, so many of them, you literally have equity investors. You know, you have these big funds like Tiger Global that are purchasing these tokens early the exact same way that they purchase equity. Like these funds are set up to buy securities and they're buying these tokens. And it's crazy to be like, these tokens aren't securities. It's like, come on, Coinbase. Yeah, it's it's tough because they make most of their money off of doing that. And because they've got so much exposure to the pre-sale sort of bag holding of all these DeFi coins that Coinbase Ventures with A16Z and the other funds have have uh, incubated, they really are in in, you know, in the next cycle if crypto is heavily regulated and this stuff turns into be all securities like regulated as securities which it is and probably will be they stand to lose billions and billions of dollars of their bag mm -hmm. bags of pre-mined coins that they're holding so they're doing everything they can to gaslight everybody and make us all think that this is some attack against freedom an attack against right. the evolution of the internet when really it's just like they're protecting their interests of like they've created something that's not real and they're generalized mining it into existence and they're really pumping billions and billions of dollars that get they created from nothing through silicon valley bank signature bank and all these banks it's funny because bitcoin was created in a response to bailouts of the banks and fractional reserve banking and the destruction of the purchasing power of your savings over time it's a sound money sort of electronic sound money uh network when you boil it down like it was satoshi mm -hmm. was a monetary historian he modeled the issuance somewhat after gold as a fixed supply there's nobody that can change the monetary policy you can't do quantitative easing in bitcoin you can't bail out anybody in bitcoin and then meanwhile what ends up happening is that the silicon valley guys get involved in all the crypto sort of cypher punks they've ended up corrupting all those values that they got into it in the first place with because they made they made so much money off of this bubble that they've suspended i believe they suspended their values around decentralization and disruption of the the the, the people that have been kind of ruining money for the bottom 50 percent and instead they've become that and now they're definitely like trying their best to defend their golden goose against regulations and really it's kind of you're seeing is a corrosion of ethics and it's also like the you know unfortunately they're becoming what they got into disrupt in the first place it seems like yeah. that I mean, with Coinbase, I think I agree that they're screwed. You know, I agree with Chanos, you know, the short selling Coinbase. Um, I think they're fine as a, you know, as the U.S. Bitcoin buy and sell platform, which was their original vision. I think there's some value. There's a few billion to be had doing that. But all the other stuff that they're doing, I think there's no core. There's no value. So it's it's mm -hmm. like they're really, you know, they're rudderless, right? They don't know what to retreat to because it's all smoke and mirrors, right? Like all these other tokens. I mean, Brain Trust is just an example that I've studied. What is closely. that one? Can you tell me about that mm -hmm. one? I've not heard of Brain Trust yeah. before. So it just happens to be something I study closely because it has a lot of VC funding. Um, so it's it's supposed to be like a, a smarter recruiting network where everybody who's participating and helping companies recruit candidates can like get some tokens in order to help the network. Um, but it's but it's pretty much but it's basically just a thinly veiled equity play. It's like hey, you can have some equity, you can have, and of course equity that's a security, right? So they're basically just like making it rain these little token securities and pretending like they're not securities and they're listing on Coinbase and the company itself is there any value you know compared to a, a normal company with normal stock? I've looked into it. There's there's no value whatsoever, and and I've looked into it. They just go and pay regular recruiters, right? They basically oh my create, god, really? Uh, they just yeah, they just use VC money to essentially just pump activity into the system. You know, there's there's not much organic activity. There's no random people being like, oh my god, I want these tokens, you know, because they're so useful. Like it's you know, it's all a mirage, just like just like Helium is, just like any Web three company is. And but again, they're listing on Coinbase, so Coinbase has to do some soul searching, right? Like, is this 
what Coinbase is about. Like, what is Coinbase about? There's not much to be about. Yeah, that's why Coinbase has lost a lot of reputation with Bitcoiners over the last five years, especially when like Brian Armstrong really turned against the Bitcoin mission in 2016. He came, he came back from Satoshi Roundtable and he wrote a blog post about how the Bitcoin developers are going to destroy Bitcoin. And now he's no longer going to be focusing his energy on Bitcoin uh, because of the block size debate. So Bitcoiners didn't want like the majority of the Bitcoin users didn't want to increase the block size. But the businesses like Coinbase and the Bitmains, like the miners and stuff like that, majority of them, about 70 percent of them wanted to increase the block size because they were getting bogged down with customer support tickets about the rising fees in the Bitcoin network. And they didn't want to invest the engineering resources and wait the couple of years it would have taken to get the Lightning Network ready and to optimize at the base layer. Instead, what they started doing in 2018, 2017, I mean, was they teamed up with all the Silicon Valley folks. They started flooding Bitcoin as too expensive to be used. So we're going to have to build Ethereum. We're going to have to build all these other networks. And Bitcoiners were there the whole time saying, if you're going to use a blockchain, you're going to run into high fees if it gets used. Like if you're trying to build every single game and every single use case on a blockchain, you're going to break your blockchain. It's going to it's going to go into high fee territory and you're going to have to scale in layers like we're doing with Bitcoin, like with the Lightning Network. And they would call us crazy maxis. We don't know what we're talking about. We're not you know, up to date on new technology, blah, blah, blah. Well, fast forward a couple of years, what happened? The first successful thing that ever got built on Ethereum kind of broke it. And the fees got so high that it didn't make sense to use it anymore for these use cases like recruiting people on the blockchain or playing games on the blockchain because blockchains aren't really good databases for that sort of thing. So right. what you have to do is scale it in layers or just kind of like don't use the blockchain <laughs> so that right, seems like right, that's right. what that's what things are even axie infinity did their own blockchain which was the ronin ronin bridge it was like a, a type of ethereum compatible side chain and that was probably the biggest most successful use case of web3 if you want to call it that where millions of people were using it and it proved out that for one it's insecure for two it's not efficient it's, it's like not as fast as playing a real game and three mostly what you talk about from the core mechanic of the axie infinity game it just doesn't make sense and if if people actually use this stuff it just breaks because the more people use it the more it exposes how dumb it is <laughs> and how it's just going to continually break and blow up and go down in value exactly yeah i mean the technology has always been like crap and you know it has many downsides right like when you use a blockchain like it is very slow and, and it's uh you know it's kind of hard to keep up because you have to keep incentivizing people to keep it up so and of course you know there's the energy usage or there's the uh, security implications so there's a million trade-offs that blockchain makes and that might be okay if the upside is high. And the problem with Web3 is the upside was al always non-existent. So it'd just be like the trade-offs, you're just making these costly trade-offs for nothing. Yes, you would be making trade-offs, but in the bubble when there's 0% interest rates and they're able to just pump, pump, pump billions into the stuff, they're, they're bags of coins that they would get from issuing these Web3 apps would just make it so appealing for people because they were actually making tons of money in, in the uh, in the bubble. Like a lot of people made exactly. money, but then everybody got rugged. And I wonder, do you think that, do you think that they, they have learned anything or do you think that they're, they've just got so much money still that they're managing that they don't want to kind of FUD their bags or whatever? Like all these guys that mm -hmm. still have hundreds of millions or billions under management. Like what do you think is going through their minds as to why they didn't reconcile that all this stuff they built was really fraudulent sort of market making and pump and dumps and Ponzi schemes. I mean, the best case study is A16Z, right? Like what is going through A16Z's head right now? I mean, they they raised a first fund uh, back in like 2014 uh, to invest in Coinbase. That was like, a, I think like a $500 million fund. And they successfully turned that 500 million into like 5 billion during the Coinbase IPO. They took the five billion, they sold off like half, locking in like a very nice return. 
and then they kind of lost the other half when Coinbase crashed like 85%. Uh, but they did very well in that first fund. Now the problem is that was a 500 million fund. They followed up with that with like another 6.5 billion over the course of three other funds. So like, yeah, okay, you did great with the first fund, but you started throwing good money after bad or bad, you know, good money after what you thought was good. So they took this other 6.5 billion and those investments, as far as I can tell, are down massively, like down well over half that other, you know, things like OpenSea, right? That they invested in like a 14 billion valuation. Like all these things are, are very much down and they're down so much that even if you look at uh, A16Z's like entire 7 billion of outlay, maybe they kind of broke even but everybody except the ones in that first small fund are completely screwed. They're not gonna be paying any carry on these other funds, right? You know, the VCs take a 20% carry. There's no gain on which you can take a carry, but the trick is the management fees, right? So like that other 6.5 billion, if you take 2% management fees, you know, VCs charge 20% carry, 2% management fees. If you take those 2% management fees over like a 10 year duration of a fund, it actually turns into about 20%. And it can vary. It can be like 13%. It can even be more than 20% sometimes. Let's say 20%. Okay, so what's 20% of, let's say, 6 billion, right? So now we're, that's like 1.2 billion in management fees as a ballpark approximation, right? Call it a billion. So A16Z, by doing like the worst job ever at investing, is getting to pocket, you know, a cool billion dollars, right? So Chris Dixon, like completely incompetent guy, making a clown of himself in public, he just made a billion dollars for A16Z, right? Thanks to these global LPs. Crazy. Well, I don't know how you think this is going to play out, but I feel like this is on, you know, the history books as the digital tulip bubble. You know, people will look back at this as the maybe everybody got swollen brains from the vaccine or got COVID or something, and everybody's brain was a little swollen, from from uh, something and low interest rates caused everybody to go out on a risk cliff and and kind of like Weimar Germany style gamble on all kinds of crazy stuff. I don't think that this is going to resolve in that. Oh, yeah, Bored Ape JPEGs were a great investment and Web3 ended up being a real thing. So it it seems like this is going to be written as like the google glasses or something like that like something really dumb that a lot of people lost reputation and lost tons of money on and i i just i'm kind of like curious how you think the next few years or whatever is going to go for all these all these like coins and coinbase and all these vcs and stuff you think any of them are going to get in trouble or do you think they're just going to kind of all switch to AI or something else and just it'll be swept under the rug? I mean, I think a lot of the damage is already done, right? So like there are a lot of funds that are underwater because they, I mean, just like most of A16Z fund, even though they're collecting those management fees, like it is a disastrous performance. And like, ironically, in 2021, Chris Dixon was number one on the Midas list, right? Because of his first Coinbase bet. But the funny thing is he really ought to have that designation removed because he's one of the worst performing investors uh, in history. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I think people will look back and they'll be like, yeah, this was a bubble, like not much value came out of it. And unlike the tech bubble, I don't think that there's going to be, you know, the Amazon and the Google, right? right? There's not going to be the, the Phoenix rising from the ashes, um, <laughs> except maybe, you know, your favorite uh, Bitcoin. I think that, I think to some degree, Bitcoin, Bitcoin I mean, we're, yeah, we're already seeing it. So... Uh, just to you know, make my position clear. So like, I'm kind of a no-coiner, okay? But I will give you guys this, that Bitcoin in some circumstances, right, can be like an emergency store of value uh, or, or something that you can uh, potentially use, you know, as a refugee. Like my, the way I think about Bitcoin is like, I'm not super bullish on it. I, I make an analogy to like ham radio, right? Like who do you know today that uses ham radio? Like pretty much nobody, okay? But in some situations, it sometimes comes in handy and it's better than nothing. That's like how I think of Bitcoin. Have you um have you ever had a chance to have a conversation with Alex Gladstein about this? I haven't talked to him one on one, but we we've done some tweets back and forth. You guys should get on a conversation together. Maybe we'll do a podcast with him sometime or something. I just, I think it's definitely worth a conversation, like a an in person chat or whatever. Have you had many uh, Bitcoiners kind of like one on one chat with you about? Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had you know. I feel like I can pass the ideological Turing test, right? So if we switch positions and I become the huge Bitcoin bull, I feel like I can put up a pretty convincing fight. But I'm not actually convinced. What do you think it is that um, makes you think of Bitcoin as a ham radio instead? Because I mean, to me, when I when I hear mm -hmm. ham radio, I'm I think that's kind of like a 
a really hyperbolic comparison because like we have way better i mean unless you think that like technology's going away completely ham radio is not really going to be that useful for <laughs> for, for anybody I mean, ham radio is useful. Like, it sucks, but sometimes life sucks so much that you pull out the ham radio. Right. right. Like, that's how I think of Bitcoin. <laughs> but, like, do you think that there's ever going to be a scenario where we get into, I don't know, solar flare that knocks out the whole entire internet or something, and then we're gonna we're not going to have the internet? Do you think we'll we'll get to that point where you you'll have to go to the ham radio? Um, I mean, I think AI is going to wipe out the internet, right? That's my separate topic. That's an interesting topic. I mean, yeah, we can have a <laughs> Bitcoin conversation another time. I'm I, I'm more than happy to have, like dive down the rabbit hole on Bitcoin and why I think it's completely separate from crypto and Web3 and DeFi and all that stuff. And also the Bitcoin adjacent stuff, like the things Bitcoiners are building, like the, the Nosters and the hole punches and things like that, which is actually the decentralized internet it's actually the distributed right. peer-to-peer internet but we're not trying to call it web3 and we're not trying to sell anybody on tokens or anything like that <laughs> it's actually just building using peer-to-peer -peer technology and file sharing file storage and retrieval that's censorship resistant and more sovereign so that you can kind of own your own identity in a way that like makes sense not to sell you a shit coin but to like actually like have your own private key that controls your identity so that I think there's there's a lot of merit there, and and it's the Bitcoiners that are building that right now, and it's because all the crypto guys need to shill their Solana coin and their Ethereum coin and whatever coin they need, so so they all have these like tokens that they gotta serve the Kool Aid up to. Like you need to have your your, your identity needs to be an NFT, otherwise this is not Web three. It's like no, like your identity can be it's a signature it doesn't need to be mm -hmm. a thing that you can buy and sell it doesn't need to be financialized but i don't know if you, it's you mentioned nostra earlier i'm not sure if you followed any of the nostra stuff or if you've played around with it or what you think of it just before we move over to the ai stuff yeah i think it's pretty cool right i think mastodon and nostra like and farcaster which i think is like the same thing except with nfts bolted on um i think those things are pretty cool i just think that um you know the network effect is strong right so i personally am tempted to stay on twitter like i haven't felt much of a pull toward those other networks because ultimately i just want to use something that's convenient that has a big audience right so it's gonna be hard to pull me away from twitter yeah i mean if and if especially if you're if you're not super interested in like Bitcoin specifically, because if mm -hmm. you can have, um, if you can integrate Satoshi's into an app like a podcasting app or a crowdfunding app or Twitter or blog post app, whatever it is, and you can do this like micro payments thing where you can earn for posting, then that's more of a draw for, for say, like somebody like me, where I'm more ideologically aligned to Noster because D Elon Musk, Elon Musk kind of is turning more and more like censor a censorship kind of platform uh it seems like they're like when when it was the left in control they were censoring political stuff but now it's like they're censoring competitive twitter things like they're censoring like mastodon and even Noster to some extent even though they rolled that back but yeah I, i'm just not ideologically aligned with where twitter's going it seems like mm -hmm. it's like makes you angry the more you spend time on it, I don't know if you get that or not. Do you do you feel like that, or or are you just having fun with uh, with Twitter? I mean, it depends who you follow, right? So I don't follow a ton of super angry people. I mean, I I think it's it's very addictive, right? That's my biggest problem with it is it's hard to be like, okay, let me time box Twitter to like half an hour a day, right? So I, t I tend mm -hmm. to end up spending more. That's my biggest issue with it. You got to check out the One Sec app. Have you seen that yet? No. Oh, got to check it out, man. I'll send you a link after. But I just recently was shown this by uh, one of my friends that works works at uh, Fidelity. He's trying to reduce his Twitter usage, too. He's a Bitcoin guy. And he's like, oh, I'm trying to be on Noster more because it's more of mm. a positive vibe there. There's, not, there's less, like, algorithmic uh, aggravation, you know? Like, you're, you're, you're shown less. On Twitter, you're definitely shown things that you that want to make you retweet and say what an idiot you know or or, yeah. or make a make a Liron video or something like that right. but this one sec app is a really amazing app that allows you it interrupts your dopamine sort of flow where you're just addictive 
addictively clicking the Twitter app. And then before you know it, you're sucked into a 30 minute doom loop. It mm -hmm. makes you take a deep breath. So when you click the Twitter app, you it makes you take a deep breath, wait five seconds, and then oh, confirm smart. that you still want to open the app. <laughs> so yeah, it, that's smart. That's smart. Yeah, definitely a ticked open Twitter. It's reduced. It's reduced my usage of Twitter quite a bit. I'm down like half to what I was before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, let's let's move over a little bit to the AI as it's very relevant to the crypto stuff because as the crypto bubble started to blow up and you know a lot of these folks that were like formerly life coaches or m social media managers or whatever that then became Web three influencers and shilling NFTs or launching DeFi coins they've kind of started to migrate away from crypto and a lot of talented developers that were actually like smart protocol level developers working on things that are uh, more technological, like zero knowledge stuff. They, they, they the, 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 com the competition for funding has heated way up for the AI stuff. And it feels like all the VCs have also shifted into investing into AI stuff. So there's right. been this mass exodus from uh, shitcoin stuff and fake web three stuff over into, into AI. And I wonder um, if you if you follow that so much that migration, or mm -hmm. are you more so just focused on like what AI is hap what's happening in AI right now, and <laughs> how scary it's going to be over the next little while? Um, I mean, I'm focused on everything. So I mean, yeah, AI is absolutely the next tech trend, and in my view, it's it's kind of crazy because I've spent most of my life being a, a classic techno optimist where a tech trend comes along and I'm like, Oh great. This is exciting. Right? Like the internet came along. Love it. Smartphone games along. Love I'm so excited by this stuff. Even VR. I'm pretty excited by VR. You know, I'm happy to put on glasses and feel like my computer is like really big. Right. I just want to have a really big computer. Right. That's like my use case for VR. Um, yeah, I want to have a really big computer and then I want to feel like when I'm working out, I want to feel like I'm like a bird who's flying, right? <laughs> like, I think that there's like some, some good use cases for VR. Um, so that's how I am generally. I'm a techno optimist. But then you saw crypto came along and I actually studied cryptography in, in college. So, I, you know, I get crypto, but it came along and I'm like, well, wait a minute. This isn't your average tech run. This is bullshit, right? It has no use cases, right? So I was kind of a downer on crypto and Web3. And now AI is coming along. And I've been thinking actually for many years, I've been reading Eliezer Yudkowsky and Less Wrong. For many years, I've been I'm like, yeah, AI is great. AI can make paradise on earth, but also it's too powerful and it's going to kill us. Right. So it's like Web3, I was like, look, this is impotent. This is just not going to do anything. This isn't a tech trend. And then with AI, I'm like, yes, it's a tech trend. It's actually the, the most powerful tech trend we've ever seen, but it's actually too powerful and it's just going to kill us. So we're not really going to enjoy it very long because it's it's going to be like setting off. It's going to go rogue. And it's it's just, yeah, it's, it's so, it's not even a tech trend. It's more like a, it's a universe trend, man. It's like, if you look at the, mm -hmm. the, the 14 billion history of our universe, the 14 billion year history, Okay, so Earth comes along 4 billion years ago. Earth is the first planet we know of where you kicked off natural selection, right? So instead of just like, you know, rocks and gravity just rolling around, suddenly you have these replicators that are getting naturally selected and they're being optimized for their ability to reproduce. So that was very interesting from a history of the universe perspective. And then humans came on the scene. And now it's very interesting that you don't just have these organisms that are just executing their behaviors, not really, you know, not really using tools, not really reflecting on themselves. But then the human brain comes along. Suddenly you have intelligence, right? They're designing a civilization. They're, they're completely destroying other ecosystems. Like we're kind of like stomping on everybody else's ecosystem right now all over the world. We're putting footprints on the moon, right? Like this is pretty unusual stuff for a life form. Um, so, so that's human intelligence. And then the, the, the next and final chapter in the story is you're going to have intelligence that isn't evolved, but it's designed, right? So you've got intelligence building intelligence. So this isn't a freaking tech trend, right? This is like the, the pinnacle of, of the history of the universe is, is coming to fruition here. So, okay. You're talking about like artificial general intelligence in the end being created and um, maybe we're a ways away from that, maybe not. But I think the more obviously realistic threat to ha that's kind of freaking me out over the last month, really, because before this, I didn't really think too much about how fast this was accelerating. I just thought, oh, lots of money is getting invested into it. We're all going to be able to have like an upgrade to our smartphone, like Siri's going to be better and Amazon's going to be able to recommend you better stuff and you'll be able to like create your own music easier and blah 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 like tool this will augment our ability to create and kind of just help us mm -hmm. in that way but then as 
I started to follow this whole agents thing and the way that people are scaling out um, AI with with agents that can mm -hmm. be then just given instructions to go execute tasks. It started my, my I started going down this thought pattern of like, what would I do with that if I was mm -hmm. like an opportunist? What? And I'm like, holy shit, with AI agents that are autonomous and can't be stopped that are tasked with, say, like, make money. Like just that, like mm -hmm. make money. Yes. And make money. if you integrate it with Bitcoin, where it can automatically make money through Bitcoin because it's uncensorable, you can't stop Bitcoin. And you integrate it with like any sort of communication technology, like say Nostr or something like that, which is an uncensorable, unstoppable messaging protocol. There is a way that you could create a lot of mess and it doesn't even have to be Bitcoin or Nostra. I was just, that's where my brain is because I'm so deep in that, in those rabbit holes. But you could just say, um, take the process of the Indian call center that's scamming people for tax rebate checks. And instead of being somewhere that could be stopped, you're now just infinite amount of agents are being created and mm -hmm. preying on people through SMS, email, Facebook. And it just, to me, it seems like we are very soft here in the West. Like we didn't grow up with much struggle. And yep. a lot of people in the, the global South grew up with a lot of real struggle. Like there's billions of people in the world that had to negotiate from the moment they could speak. They have to figure out how to mm -hmm. negotiate to eat and survive. And we don't have that skill here. So we're just a bunch of soft targets, rich, fluffy, fat, soft targets for mm -hmm. extraction <laughs> and scamming. And I used to think that it was going to be that, like, as Starlink was deployed widely and we were going to basically have this battle where it was the global south, like a bunch of scammers, like millions mm -hmm. of scammers coming online, preying on fat, juicy, privileged Westerners and just scamming them. But now with this AI agent thing, I'm thinking it's it's going to just be AI scamming people. And it's just going to mm -hmm. be like the internet is just going to be nothing but scams and fraud. And you're just going to be like, mm -hmm. everything's going to be a mess. So I don't know. Walk me through where you're thinking about this. And if you think it's going to be worse than that or, or what you know, I, com I completely agree. So I do think that what you're describing, you know, social engineering attacks, uh, I do think they're going to be one of the first, like at the vanguard of the AI doom. So, I mean, you, you've probably already seen like the YouTube video where like this mom's getting a call and it sounds like it's her daughter, right? And it's, no, like, I didn't. Eight. What's that? What's that? Yeah, it's like an AI generated voice. And it's like, oh, help, I'm being kidnapped, right? And it's like her daughter's voice. Oh my right? God, and really? Yeah, I don't know the exact details, but it was basically like, okay, you need to send money, right? You need to go to Walmart, get a Jesus. gift card. So, I mean, the world has a population of people who are And so are, that was know, all, old. That, was, well, that was all AI? That was like somebody... Yeah, it was, somebody... all, it was all AI. So, I mean, this is very effective, especially imagine somebody who's 70 years old, right? Doesn't really understand wow. technology, getting a call from a family member being like, send money. So you know, that's going to be like the vanguard. You're going to see a lot of social engineering The you're going to see like the perfect phishing email, right? That's like customized, you know, spear phishing is like a phishing email that's customized for an individual person. So you're going to get a lot of AI spear phishing. Um, just the idea of proving yourself. It's like, okay, can you get on a video call with me? Okay, well, it's just an AI pretending to be you. It looks exactly like you, moves exactly like you, talks exactly like you. Um, so it's, it's gonna, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that are being tested, you know, like the idea of how do you prove your identity when an AI can just completely simulate you over the internet and then you're going to, okay, you have to show up in person, I guess. Right. Like, so there's going to be a lot of dilemmas like that, but again, this is just the beginning, right? So I think the wave hits you a lot harder once af after that point. Um, so for example, there's the idea of computer viruses. So we don't think that much about computer viruses today, but um, they're actually a pretty big problem when you have a big target. So like hospitals are constantly getting ransomware, right? Like all, all these, basically these fat juicy targets, somebody in Russia who's not as worried about going to prison is gonna do his best to be holding a hospital hostage. And this stuff happens, right? Like th these ransomware, there are, um, I don't know the, the exact number, but I know that I mean, it's bigger than you might think because there's a virus, for example, from 2004, it's called My Doom. Uh, between 2004 and now, it's been going for like 20 years. It's done an estimated $56 billion of damage. 
Just this wow. one random virus spreading on the internet. Like, I don't, yeah, how did it do $60, $56 billion of damage? It's just like computers are always waiting to get attacked by the next virus. And like, it does do a lot of damage. You know, like Maersk famously had to like, you know, restore from a backup after like all their computers got like super infected, uh, you know, like the world's biggest shipping company. Um, so these viruses are going rogue, but today's viruses are pretty dumb, right? They just have like a few clever hacks in them written by a human programmer. Imagine if the virus was like an entire Einstein brain. Jesus. Right, that could copy itself and so and, now, and program yeah. and te- and and like rewrite itself and tell it to make right, it even worse itself. viruses. Exactly, so it's like you've got Albert Einstein living in your freaking iPhone, right? Just like helping be part of a botnet, right? And it's and the thing is that there's so many nooks and crannies to hide in a modern computer. You can you can format your hard drive. Okay, turns out it was living in like the cache memory of one of your GPUs. It's like you can't wipe. The, there's too many nooks and crannies. Like it's it's going to be a disaster. Um, you're going to have this virus that's just absolutely going rogue, a super intelligent virus, like taking over the internet because it's going to discover zero day exploits. So like all this yeah. code that we think is like solid, well tested code. Um, you know, government, the NSA, the the United States is a hacking agency, right? It keeps finding these exploits and it keeps them close to the vest, right? Yeah. You can buy you can buy a zero day exploit for like a million dollars, but this AI. You know how today GPT-4, you can ask it to write you a couple pages of code, right? Like it can't write a big program, but it can write, it can write a couple pages of code, right? Yeah. So pretty soon with GPT-5 or GPT-6, you can be like, hey, take a look at this code base. It has like a thousand pages of code. Go find me the vulnerability, right? And it's right. going to be a little be like, oh, here's 10 vulnerabilities. And you're like, okay, great. Now go take over every computer running like, you know, SQL Server, right? Or like any Microsoft product, for instance, right? Take over every computer on Amazon Web Services for me right now and defend it. So you're talking about like uh, the next iteration of the AI system, mm-hmm. like uh, GPT-5 or whatever. I think that it's even worse, man. I think that because I've been on, a, I've been looking at investing in this company, a friend of mine that pivoted from like uh, some DeFi shitcoin project that you know he created two years ago. He went over to AI, and now he's raising for this AI startup. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, this is a smart guy maybe I'll invest in it. So I started doing some calls with him and man, like he's building a system that's based on uh Yang chain or Lang chain, which is mm-hmm. all the LLMs, right? It's like an, an API right. sort of open source, all the LLMs you can code with them or whatever, integrate them all into your code. And they're building this agent marketplace. where just using all the existing LLMs. They're allowing you to create an agent that does one task, whether whatever that one task right. is like, connect to the SMS network through Twilio. And this AI agent just open and closes SMS connections to Twilio, uh, create email accounts. And it just, this agent does just creating email accounts. Another one is like, you know, write reviews, say, right? Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a marketplace of the current limited, like the limited GPT-4 stuff, but that has the token limitations and all that. Once you put them into this agent's, paradigm where they can then refer to each other and like have another basically 100x their memory then they can start talking to each other and like using other agents to create bigger and bigger tools i think that's where if you have like a million of these different types of agents that all do one thing really good and then know how to talk to each other before we get to gpt5 we can have mass disruption on the internet through Mm -hmm. unstoppable spamming and extraction you're talking about something that's different i think you're talking about something that's like a really smart ai that can write its own Mm -hmm. viruses and stuff like that i think what i'm worried about over the next six to 12 months is complete everybody just gets bogged down with spam and scams and (laughs) and like if you have say i was just thinking about this yesterday like if i was a, a sort of like a shady web guy right and or if i was a reputation manager and i was a little shady and i was like i can get i can i can get you more users to your restaurant Mm -hmm. well i would just be able to create a system that creates hundreds of google accounts or infects existing users but not for the not for the point of hacking them and exploiting them but just for the fact that you can hack somebody and then use their identity in some other scam so you can like without them even knowing you can go yeah, there and yeah, be like course. review brigading somebody on some other city that you'd never see right yeah so like theft, yeah 
identity identity theft in a way that's not even impacting you it's just actually using your identity to say for in this instance let's say you say i can get you more users to your to your restaurant you create an agent based uh like auto gpt or yeager or something like that based ai agent system that's over the next three months it's just tasked with creating a hundred accounts making it appear like a human like using LLM to go and write posts on Twitter and act like a human and, Mm -hmm. you know, use different time intervals between when it posts and, you know, not, not act like an AI thing. And then just Mm -hmm. slowly start review brigading all your competition and slowly give you good reviews and post photos because they can use Mm -hmm. LLMs to create photos. And then all of a sudden you've got this system where it's, it's just like everything you see online is fake. And so, you can't I mean, tell what's real. You're making a lot of good points, right? I, but you're still talking at the level of problems where they conceivably have solutions, right? So you're saying, oh my God, you can't tell what's real. Okay, but maybe you could have, as long as you don't have robot bodies that look like humans, maybe you can show up in person to a government office, right? And then they can give you a cryptographic private key and then you can use digital signatures, right? So like maybe there are these workarounds, right? I'm more concerned when it's just game over. I literally think in a few years, it's just going to be game over. Like we can't even fight it. Um, I think that, you know, you have a virus, for instance, that goes rogue on the whole internet. You turn on your computer. It's like, sorry, your computer is busy being a botnet. Like, fuck off. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) This computer is taken right now. Um, It's it's just not the internet. I think the internet's not going to work. I think that our infrastructure is not going to work. That's, that's nuts. Okay. So the, the world that I'm worried about is way less doomy than the world that you're worried about and not that i don't want to you know yeah, go and there. I think there's no undo by the way i think once you open up this can which we're doing now I, I just think it's game over it's it's i use the metaphor of bricking the universe the same way you brick your phone like when your phone's bricked you know sure you have a reset button the universe doesn't have a reset button so in a world where everything is you're constantly DDoS by spam that's unstoppable and your communication channels are just barely usable because they can't stop they can't stop the AI agents and then we get into a world where maybe cryptography becomes more important because there is a way to kind of like test your identity through cryptography and uh, mm-hmm. and web of trust models which yeah i think we, you know we can you can have identity right but it just won't matter right like identity is yeah and that, issue. but the issue but is then you're getting attacked then you're going to the next level of i mean this is the situation where um somebody uses CRISPR to like make everyone sterile <laughs> you know like by I mean, putting some look. sort of shit <laughs> in the water and everybody's sterile we don't reproduce anymore you're talking about a system that's going to shut down the entire internet. Right. If, if you read some of the AI doom literature, there is a good case that the AI is, is going to have ways to manipulate the physical world. So one of them that gets very science fiction is it's going to build nanotechnology. It's just going to build the smallest possible robots, molecular scale robots, the same way that a ribosome in a, in a biological cell is building proteins, right? Mm-hmm. You can do that, except you don't even have to use proteins. You can use stronger bonds. You can basically make a diamondoid uh, type of robots. Like you get, okay. it, there's, there's books on nanotechnology. So this is very science fiction. I personally think it's plausible but I don't try to get other people to believe it because just I can give you a more down-to-earth doom scenario. You don't even have to believe my crazy doom scenario. So one of the doom scenarios is just like, look, you just have human employees. Like it's not hard to believe that the AI goes on the internet and it has ways to make money. It can intelligently trade stocks to make money. It can build Mm -hmm. websites. It can do e-commerce to make money, right? And once it's got, you know, it can use Bitcoin to make money, whatever, right? It can pump. Uh, It's got ways to make money. I don't think that's a hard sell. Uh, If it's making money, it can hire humans. And it can also mm-hmm. blackmail humans. Like, hey, I, I caught you, you know, watching uh, kitty porn on the dark net, and now you're, you know, you're my slave. I think we lost Brad. All right, I guess I'll just keep ranting and, until Brad comes back for for the live viewers. Um, yeah. So, oh, hey. I hit the back button on my mouse. Oops. Yeah, no worries, man. <laughs> We're um, still live, but, thankfully. Yeah, yeah. So I was saying, so AI can employ people. And AI can also threaten blackmail people, right? So if, if it catches you watching porn that you don't want people to know you're, you're watching, okay, great. Now it's got this blackmail wow, that can that's, do. Dude, that's nuts. So how long do you think we are from seeing something like this reality? 
Um, I, I think we're a few years away because this is the scenario as I see it. If you look at GPT-4, GPT-4 is not going to take over the world. It's not quite there yet, right? It has, it, we notice that it has flaws. Um, but if you look at auto GPT and chaos GPT, people are, are building a harness, right? They're building like the chassis of a car and they're putting the engine in the car, which is GPT-4. And, and you're, you're asking, you're saying, Hey, how far can this engine drive me? Right. And mm -hmm. GPT-4, it's not a very strong engine. Um, but when you put a better engine, like this is, we have the car that we need to like, you know, drive to hell or right? I got to work on this metaphor. But like the idea is like the only reason chaos GPT doesn't actually cause chaos is because the engine, the GPT-4, it's not quite good enough. So right. maybe GPT-5 will actually cause chaos. Maybe GPT-6 will cause chaos. There's a specific dimension on which, like when I say good enough, what does that mean good enough? Okay, there's a precise definition, which is called optimization power. When you give the AI a goal, how effective is it at achieving the goal? GPT-4, if the goal is pass this medical exam that qualifies you to be a doctor, it's actually really good at that, right? So there's some goals. If you say, hey, play against me chess, it's reasonably good at that. It's not great, it's pretty good. So there's different goals and it's different quality at achieving the goal. If you said, hey, um, go try to win a war, right? <laughs> try, to, try to help the US win a war against China, it's not that great at that, right? So there's some goals, or if it's just like, hey, kill the president, right? Assassinate the president, is it good at that goal? No, not right now. Right, but the thing is that the kinds of inferences that AI is starting to be able to make, like if you know how to diagnose a medical condition, you mm -hmm. probably have some of the brain infrastructure that helps you figure out how to conduct terrorism. Like there is some overlap between these kinds of types totally. of intelligence. Yeah, yeah, it, it's like, the, are you worried about the 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 ability of like the gates that have been put on it? to remain in place like do you think that the, there's the gates be... are complete bullshit it's larping it's larping when OpenAI says this is our most aligned model all they mean is that by default when you try to conduct a normal conversation with it it can like detect if you're like veering toward topics that aren't you know politically correct right that aren't woke <laughs> or even if you say hey how do i build a bomb it's like i'm not going to tell you how to build a bomb but the thing is there's always jailbreaks so if you talk to the actual people who are on the red team at OpenAI who are testing the alignment they will tell you yeah it's aligned 99 percent of the time if you want to ask it how to build a bomb you just have to do this a few little tricks to jailbreak it and it'll tell you it'll tell you anything that it knows crazy so when you when you ask the question why is gpt4 not helping people terrorize the world right now it's not because it won't it will it's because it can't. That's the only reason is it lacks the capabilities. And what are a bunch of well-funded labs are doing right now? Adding capabilities. Yeah. Um, it, it, were you worried at all about the CRISPR problem like five, 10 years ago or five years ago or say when, when it became cost effective enough for like college students to be able to mess around with like editing genes and then potentially releasing some kind of crazy species disrupting thing into the oceans or something like that were you ever, were you as worried about that as you were about the ai stuff or are you kind of more kind worried of, about uh, the if you look at the rationality community and the effective altruism community uh, pandemics are always up there right and like even before covid you can there's a lot of uh, uh literature put out by this community that i'm part of being like yeah hey we should be worried about a what's pandemic. the community but, uh rationality is one community and effective rationality. altruism Okay. Yeah. I have, so, so yes, yeah, so I'm a, a self-titled uh, rationalist. Um, there's, uh, you know, I, I've studied a lot of things on like how the brain works and like, you know, human biases and like how the ideal AI brain should work. So it's very interesting because, you know, the idea of rationality is like, we're all born with this brain. Our brain is like pretty amazing, but it wasn't designed as a tool to like think accurate thoughts with. Right? Like evolution didn't be like, let me make a creature that's really good at thinking accurate thoughts. No, evolution said, let me make a creature that's good at surviving and reproducing and competing. Where right? does it's ethics a, come yeah. into the, the rationality space? Like where do the rationalists, what do they think about ethics and that part of yeah. the conversation? I mean, so we're, you know, we're not like Mr. Spock, right? We're, it's like we have emotions, we have ethics. Um, one example of rationalist ethics is pointing out, of, uh, pointing out the obvious idea that like, hey, death is bad and it's bad at any age. Like we don't think somebody should die just because they're 80 years old. We think that life extension should be an option for everybody. And if people want to live forever, we think that it would be nice for them to have that option. And, and what about when it comes to more like nuanced stuff like financial issues or free markets or things like free right uh human rights like uh property rights or free speech things like that yeah so you know rationalist i guess opinions can vary i mean i'm personally pretty libertarian right i see a lot of value in free speech and i see a lot of value in small government and you know one of my favorite economists is brian kaplan and, and he's a good champion for a lot of this stuff 
so the the rationalists that that kind of like are thinking through this AI th- stuff are they thinking about it from the lens of we should be protected because it's kind of a conflicting thing that's happening, right? If you're a rationalist and you believe in free speech, but you also don't want people to die, like there's probably some sort of like middle ground you might land on where when it comes to AI. I think I think I've seen you tweet something recently about how you think that it should be paused or mm-hmm. something should happen. I don't know. What, what, what are your thoughts there? Like, how do you balance those two? Yeah, I look, I think, oh, I see what you're saying. So on one hand, I love the, you know, freedom of development, right? If you look at the history of computers and the internet, we've gotten so much value because people are free to develop it, right? Like I'm so happy that the internet was not more regulated than it was, right? Because we see so much innovation. Like I personally run a startup on the internet and I think it's great. Here's the problem. We're all about to die. <laughs> like it's kind of a big problem. It's kind of a big problem. Like I and and so my position is I do think that we need to hit the brakes on AI capabilities development. And I think the only way that I can even imagine, I don't even think this is going to work, but I think the only hope we have is if the US government steps in and says it is not legal right now to train a larger, more powerful model than GPT-4. GPT-4 is already revolutionary. It's already creating mass economic disruption. I've already seen dozens of people get laid off because they've literally been replaced by a GPT-4 agent. So GPT-4 is no slouch, but it also, I think we pushed our luck building GPT-4 because we don't know when AI is gonna cross the threshold of, gro- of going rogue. And one day, I think we should make a super intelligent agent. I think that a super intelligent agent could potentially create heaven on earth. But I think that humanity today is not ready for a super intelligent agent. And I think that such an agent, if created today, would create hell on earth and never have a chance to undo that hell on earth. I think we just all die and the universe sucks. So beyond the AI becoming like a super intelligent virus creator that infects everything and bogs the internet down and eventually shuts down the internet, like how do you see it actually leading to deaths? Yeah, so... If you just uh, if you grant my premise that it's going to be so disruptive to the internet that the internet is going to be unusable, without an internet, the economy is going to shrink at least twenty percent. Because if you go back to the point in time, let's say nineteen ninety, before we had the internet, world GDP was ten percent of what it is today. So it's very what fair year, to say sorry? that around nineteen ninety, world GDP was about ten percent of what it is today. Wow, really? Is that yeah. measured in like in, adjusted for inflation or is that just like yeah adjusted for inflation you know maybe it's eight times so I don't have the precise figure but that's roughly the ballpark and yeah maybe I can pull it up as we're talking but so you know it's very reasonable to think that the world GDP will instantly shrink at least twenty percent with no internet. yeah twenty percent well, seems reasonable at least when you shrink world GDP tw- and and you know and no internet computers without the internet I'm not very optimistic about those working power stations I'm not very optimistic about those working without the kind of coordination that the internet helps them but get how in the hosp- like hospitals. How, how could you stop the AI development it seems like it's beyond what GPT-4 already like there's already capabilities that Nvidia and Oracle and these these companies have that's beyond GPT-4 they just haven't released them yet mm-hmm yeah, it's it's super hard to stop. I, I completely agree. And like I said, I don't think this plan is very good, but I think that it's it's a desperate plan, right? It's like, yeah. I think we're screwed <laughs> and I think it's time to do something desperate. Um, have you ever heard of Jeff Booth or, or his book, The Price of Tomorrow? No. Uh, you should read it. It's a really good book. It's, it's, it's a book about technology being deflationary and the economic impacts of technologies you know, disrupting a lot of jobs and shrinking GDP and making things cheaper and things like that. Mm-hmm. And it, it's it's actually kind of like, the, it was written four or five years ago, so it was kind of theorizing about how AI could disrupt jobs in some aspects of the book, but it wasn't really like focused on AI, mm-hmm. just technology generally. And the premise, the central premise of the book is that like central bankers target inflation. And the modern Mm -hmm. economy is based off of credit and our money is debt. So credit is needed to continually be injected into the system to create new money to create a baseline of inflation. Because the way that our system has worked for the last 50 years, it's not uh, constrained by gold or any sort of sound money standard. So we just have to continually creating money, issuing more debt in order to meet the mandates that the central bankers have set of 2% inflation. But on the flip side, you have technology that gets better and better and better, and it actually makes things cheaper. 
So you have two opposing forces. You have the, the centralized sort of political will of the central bankers and politicians that want to see the economy grow and inflate with the natural effects of deflation, which and both of those things actually provide a counter uh, benefit. One benefits rich people and one benefits poor people. The inflation target that the central banks have benefits the people at the top the most because it inflates asset prices. And most people don't have assets. Most people don't have stocks. They don't own their own home. They have savings and they don't have that much savings. And when you continually inflate things and you fight the natural effects of, of technology, it makes things more expensive. And then so the people at the bottom get punished the most. If we have a system where AI just becomes so unstoppable that it disrupts the ability for the gatekeepers to keep things inflating, and it actually causes mass innovation in things like medical technology and job replacement, et cetera, it will crash markets. If the GDP shrinks 20%, oh, yeah. it, we will see a massive recession. And it, I think there's a hopeful scenario where maybe the AI does disrupt the economy so much that it completely breaks this sort of centralized inflation based debt based credit system we live under right now, but provides so many technological advances to people that the mass majority of humans benefit from it. And the rich people are just kind of wrecked financially. Do you think we could sort of see it go there or or do you think maybe it's just going to kill us all? <laughs> I just think that there, the argument for why it's going to kill us all is just so strong that it's really hard for me to imagine. The, the only way that I imagine it playing out any other way is if it doesn't get smart enough. Like it being smart is the, is the lethal danger. So the best case scenario that's plausible in my mind is that for the next 50 years or even just 10, I'll even take 10 or 20, um, for, right? So for the next few decades, GPT-4, GPT-5, if we get lucky and it just doesn't get that much smarter. But that's why I, I get terrified when I see all these tests that GPT-4 is passing that are comparable to human level performance. I'm like, okay, well, I don't even know how much, how many levels of intelligence are left between mm. GPT-4 and humanity. It's very hard to say. Like if you'd asked me in 2017, hey, what are some of the key things that humans can do that AI can't do yet? I'd be like, oh, well, of course, like talking intelligently, having an intelligent conversation, having deep insight about the conversation, writing an essay. Right, like these being are like funny. fundamentally yeah, Cre creating funny, exactly. humor, creating creating music, like <laughs> right, or even understanding yeah. a medical case study, right? Like these yeah. are like fundamentally human skills. I mean, most humans aren't smart enough, right, to understand a medical case study, right? You have to have like you know 110, 120 IQ minimum if you want to be like a competent doctor who can get these kind of scores. So I would have been like, yeah, this is one of the last things human have that AI doesn't have. Or I'd be like, you know, drawing like a, a, a really nice artwork, right? Or like responding to a prompt and drawing something, you know, that looks realistic according to what the prompt tells you. And now these things are falling and it's like, it's hard to even tell you what's left. Like obviously something is left, right? Cause I'm not worried that GPT-4 is gonna murder me personally, but it's mm -hmm. hard for me to even describe what types of firewalls are left between that and the AI that can terrorize us. Uh, yeah, it seems like it's mostly, if, if we're talking about any time in the next five, 10 years or something like that, about the threat of humans, you know, AI to humans, it would be like, it takes over all the Teslas and just starts ramming into people or something like that. Or, or it takes I, I, control I, of missile silos and start launching them or something like I mean, that. The, the mechan there are so many mechanisms to create havoc. I mean, if you want to just get your intuition going, just imagine, look, you literally just have a smart team. Imagine like all the smartest people, you know, get in a room together and they can all think 10 times faster also, right? Subjectively time moves 10 times slower. And they're all just in a bunker, right? They just live in a bunker. They go on the internet. They're not worried about going to jail. And also they can clone themselves and they're just trying to mess with humanity. Yeah. The scale of damage that they can do when they really put their heads together, right? And just imagine like a hundred geniuses, right? Like the hundred smartest people you've ever met all in a room and their life's mission is to like clone themselves and create terror. They would be very creative. See, like I, I have been trying to think of the not trying to but i just can't help myself but wandering to those spots as i learn more about the agents and i've got a friend that's working for oracle now building out oracle's ai data center that they're spending billions of dollars on and he's telling me like the things that they're doing is beyond gpt4 and soon in the next like six months ai will be able to just recreate anything you want it to code wise he thinks that like code yeah. the value of coders is going to go to zero unless you're like a top one percent elite coder 
that yeah, I mean, AI that's, will be able to do. If that's really it. true, if that's really true, then I think we're that's that might be a sufficient condition for Doom because okay, anything I wanted to okay, a zero day exploit, right? It's like okay, get me all of AWS, a program that gets me all of AWS, right? To the, that I own the computing power of all of AWS, and then I use it to train a smarter agent. I think and, what he then, meant more so was like anything that you like wanted to build anything that exists yeah, already. Yeah, no, I, I know that's what he's saying, right? But what's crazy is people have these visions and they're like, hey, wouldn't this be cool? And they don't realize that if we have the capabilities to do the thing that they think is so cool, we mm -hmm. also have the capabilities to have rogue agents that break yeah. the connection to humanity. That's the problem is when you have an intelligent agent. And remember, you said this before. You're like, hey, what if you just ask it to help you make money for your business? Right? right. If you just ask it this most innocent goal, or famously, you probably heard, you know, the paperclip example, right? Just like, make me some paperclips. Any goal that you have, you I haven't heard realize... that one. What's, what's that one? Um, so the paper group example is, um, this is actually, it's not, the original story is, um, you just, you set it off with some random goal, like, Hey, help my business make more money. And then eventually for some reason, after it self modifies itself, it gets it into its head that like, it would be really great if the universe just had a, a bunch of molecular spirals. Like, why did that get into its head? Because it turns out that, uh, it, the training data, we didn't really extrapolate the training data in order to, to know what happens when it kind of gets out into the physical world. Like it's too different from its training environment so because of some random quirk in the ai's uh you know model these giant matrices this linear algebra it turns out we didn't know this when we trained it but it turns out that it just loves molecular spirals for whatever reason and so now it's like let me just take all the resources on earth in order to build as many little molecular spirals shaped at, like paper clips as i can um and at that point it's just like unstoppable it's like oh my god we fucked up so bad how do we get this ai but it's just too late because it's like let me just build this fortress that no, let, let me just build bunkers all over the world. Let me hire humans all over the world. And it's like, what the hell is going on? Where's the off button, right? But the concept <laughs> of an off button do, doesn't make sense. It's just like, honestly, humanity is going to die in a way that looks very stupid and undignified. It's not going to die in a cool way. <laughs> Everybody's going to have a board ape yacht club picture, and they're going right. to be living in a in a fortress of paper clips, getting paid by an AI that's just designing itself to to blow up the earth. Yeah, and even that is probably cooler than what's really going to happen. I mean, what's, what's really going to happen might just be like, look, the AI, it's busy taking over the universe, so it needs to like do these rocket launches in order to spread itself to other planets, and it doesn't care about collateral damage of the rocket launch, right? So if, you're, if a rocket is launching on your block, you're not going to be surviving that. <laughs> well, what do you think the timeline is for some doom scenario like that, like 50 years or something? Um, so I would have told you 50 years if we were having this conversation a few years ago, but GPT-4, you know, the GPT sequence has really scared a lot of us, you know, observers. Um, it's, it's, it's basically going faster than we expected. I really am like kind of scared about the idea of your online presence and any, like that concept that the WEF put out a few years ago of you will, the year is 2030, you will own nothing, you will have no privacy and you will be happy. Uh -huh. I kind of feel like they, they mistakenly got two thirds of that right. Like you are going to be owning nothing and you are going to have no privacy because of AI, but you won't be happy about it unless right. they feed us like happy pills or something. I guess then you'll be happy about it. But they, that they does might, right? <laughs> like that, the way that they're going with monetary policy and uh, printing so much money to kind of paper over all the problems with the current banking system and the, and the economy. It does feel like that is the wealth gap is getting higher and higher, like the, the difference mm -hmm. between the rich and the poor is getting wider and wider. Inflation is growing and there doesn't seem to be any sign of them wanting to sort of switch gears. And, and we have sort of like three things happening all at once right now that I feel like is just going to be completely disruptive, even if we don't have that GPT-5 20% GDP destruction that you're talking about. We're going to definitely have a financial crisis because of AI. Because AI is like the ultimate technological deflation. It's going to come mm -hmm. with, you, you're talking about people that have already lost their jobs because agents can do it better. GPT agents can do it better. That trend is going to keep accelerating through, mm -hmm. through these agent marketplaces. Yeah. Plus, we're coming into like a major recession. We, it, without AI disrupting all the tech companies and all these people that work for you know online startups that do this or that that can be disrupted by ai agents we're already seeing signs of recession so people mm -hmm. are going to be like pinching their pennies again and they're not going to be so willing to be spending on all this stuff and with ai being able to recreate whatever you want we'll be able to i think i think we're going to come up into the next couple of years next year maybe to a situation where you have decentralized technology that actually is based on cryptography and and is 
sort of somewhat resistant to censorship by centralized companies and governments. So you'll have things like Noster and um, Hypercore and Hyperdrive and Hole Punch and all these different peer-to-peer file storage and retrieval and and messaging systems and Bitcoin through Lightning Network. You will you do have this evolution of real decentralized technology that's hard to stop, plus AI that can recreate anything you want it to and become sort of out there as an agent working on behalf of whatever someone tells it to do and a recession coming. All those things to me are signs that like the economy is about to get wrecked and people are about to lose all their privacy and they're going to have to like something disruptive seems like it's on the pipeline. I don't Mm -hmm. think it's quite like we're all going to die in the next five years or something like that if this keeps going. But I do think that like life as we know it is going to change. Mm -hmm. The current way that we enjoy the comforts of the Internet and that companies enjoy the benefits of the Internet is completely going to change because Mm -hmm. the value of technology is going to go down and down and down as AI becomes more ubiquitous and can do whatever you want it to. You'll be able to say just like recreate me Netflix so I don't have to pay for it and like it will do it. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, it will be unstoppable. Yeah. Like, <laughs> No, I, I agree. So I, I do think there's going to be a few year period before AI is smart enough to, to slaughter us. There's going to be a few year period where I do think we're going to see a lot of uh, unemployment. Like if you look at most jobs that people are doing remotely, I mean, that's the funny thing. There's some jobs, like if you look at teachers at school, to some degree, they're kind of serving a babysitter function. So you kind of need that warm body, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're doing like a physical warm body job or, you know, working in a factory, if the robots can't do your job yet. But if you're doing remote work, unless you're helping like program the AI, right? Or, or, or doing a skill that the AI hasn't learned yet. A lot of people doing remote work, they're doing a lot of chatting, they're doing like coordination. Uh, you know, the Philippines I think is gonna be devastated, right? Because the things that you're outsourcing to the Philippines are kind of the perfect tasks to outsource to the AI. Yeah, so you were talking about how you run a startup. I think it's about relationship coaching. Yeah, relationshiphero.com. So it's very simple. So you come there and you just, uh, you you get connected to a relationship coach and you can talk about your relationship. And yeah, I mean, a lot of our customer service functions are already being assisted by GPT-4 because the language is just such high quality. So the the relationship hero, it's kind of like any kind of, any kind of relationship so it's like a co-founder you have a problem with or a teacher it's more, or a it's spouse more romantic or... so it's kind of okay. like hey i'm going going through a hard breakup or i'm like going on a date and it's sometimes people are literally like hey what does this text mean or like help me send a good text oh really how long have you yeah. been running this for actually six years so it's like an interesting wow, really? i was kind of yeah i was the first customer because i would always like use dating apps i'm like what the hell do i say right because i'm kind of like a you know <laughs> i'm just like a a classic nerd where i'm just like what's going on you know how does dating work <laughs> that's cool man so you've run this and then now you got to the point where you can replace the advice with gpt no no, or... no. so the, the coach we still have human coaches because that's that's basically our business model is you come to relationship here if you want a real human coach i do think ai coaches are pretty good the same way ai doctors are pretty good and we actually just launched a feature where we have an experimental ai coach but our competitive advantage you know we didn't build the ai it's powered by open ai um, if you just want an AI coach, you can always just talk to chat GPT. Our advantage is if you want a real human who can really empathize with you, you know, we're the best source of human coaches. Um, that said, you know, for how long does the world need human coaches for? It's possible that their job is going to get disrupted. That's going to be up to the demand of our clients, right? So we're just going to roll the punches. We're going to see what the clients want. But for now we're banking on, okay, some people are going to really want a human with a real soul or whatever people believe, right? That's what we're going <laughs> to offer. So you're you're not yet at the point where you're seeing that that role be disrupted by the the, the agents, but uh, maybe what like next couple of years you think that might happen? I, I mean, I think there's there's kind of naturally. I mean, our coaching costs like a hundred dollars an hour or more. So if you're paying a hundred dollars an hour, you probably want the human, right? You want gotcha. that that real individual attention, and also like video calls. Uh, you know, you like that empathy. You you like that eye contact. But um, what about and, if it's just fake fake video? Yeah, yeah. Like. <laughs> How could you I mean, tell? I, so I absolutely agree. I mean, it's we're, we're going to have to take our cues from the market, right? So if everybody's saying like, you know what? I actually would prefer a robot. I don't want somebody with a soul <laughs> judging me, right? I want to just talk to the machine. <laughs> then I'd be like, okay. I mean, and that, you know, it's it, we'll either pivot our business or we won't have a business or we'll have a smaller business, right? So like I have to accept that reality just like a lot of businesses and a lot of employees. Have you seen anything because you're kind of paying attention to this, this the VC space, I bet a lot more than most people. Are you seeing anything kind of in private beta right now that's shocking you or is like all the crazy shit just already out there we see it all 
I mean, what's shocking to me is the fact that people are so excited about auto GPT and chaos GPT. They're basically like, all right, guys, I'm ready to blow up the world. Just give me the engine and I'll blow up the world. I'm like, oof. So um, where do you get like, where do you get your news on, yeah. on this stuff? Where, where, where can people kind of stay up to date without becoming like a full time analyst for AI yeah. stuff? Like how, how, what's the best resource for people to kind of stay up to date on on the crazy shit happening in AI? So the best resource is going to be my Twitter because every day I'll tweet okay. one or one or two things about like, hey, here's the latest on AI Doom. And like one of the things I've been tweeting recently is just like, there's a lot of, so here's what's crazy is you may, you know, a lot of your listeners, they probably haven't heard uh, an interview yet where somebody's saying like, hey, we're all going to die. But I'm not the only one saying this. If you actually, like my view is not that far from the consensus view. Like I think that there's like a 50% chance that we're literally going to get slaughtered in the next couple decades. But if you look at what does the average person think, it's about a 10% chance if you're looking at the average person who's working in AI. So they did a survey, I tweeted about this, um, and they, they surveyed everybody who's you know professionally working in the field of AI, and they said, what do you think is the chance that the AI, you know, the type of AI that you're working on is gonna get smart enough that it's actually going to directly cause human extinction? Right, a pretty crazy question. Like what, why would that be more than 1%? <laughs> But the, the median person is saying, oh, yeah, 10%. It's like, what? what? You, you think you're going to extinct humanity with a 10% chance? So when That's I come on this crazy. podcast, I'm like, hey, guys, we're all going to die. It's not actually oh, – part of what I'm doing is just diffusion. I'm just trying to diffuse. I'm saying, hey, guys, look over here. Like this is what the consensus of scientists are saying. If you've ever heard of Max Tegmark, he's, he's one of the most famous physicists alive today. Uh, he has a bunch of books about physics. He, is li he literally went on Lex Friedman uh, a couple weeks ago, and he's like – I look at my kids and I, I wonder if my kids are going to ever, you know, reach high school because of this AI threat. He's like, I'm living in the movie Don't Look Up. So you may be hearing it from me for the first time, but one of my jobs is not just to understand and explain why we're doomed. It's also just to be the messenger and to be like, experts think we're doomed. Look at the experts. But if if you even think that it's not going to work to stop the AI development, like what can we do about it? Well, I have one plan that has some chance of working, and the plan is build the political will to get our government to say, this is not allowed. You can't train the next model right now. We're not ready. But, dude, like, they've already got them, like, in private, apparently. They've already got the, oh, not, not GPT-5, but, like, 5x more powerful than GPT-4. They've got stuff like so that. I think there's a good chance that 5x more powerful than GPT-4 is still not going to destroy the world. Will right. 10x more powerful destroy the world? I don't know. I think there's one choke point. I think this is our last opportunity slipping away to just tell people to stop building. Oh, man, but that's not going to work. <laughs> okay, I agree. And then, okay, I agree. So we're doomed. <laughs> like, I'm just so saying this is one. We might as well do the last ditch effort. I'm thinking about, like, how can you protect your passwords from the AI? Like, just cracking your passwords, and you're over here thinking, like, we're all going to die because somebody's yeah, going to create an few, AI that launches all ahead. the nukes. Like, the nukes I'm are going to come. I'm thinking a few steps ahead, yeah, because here's the problem. Normally, it's you just you don't have to think ahead, right? You just kind of roll with the punches, right? Like, the U.S., okay, Pearl Harbor, all right, now let's get into the war, yeah. right? Normally, you just don't have to think too far ahead. Even COVID, it's like, okay, we didn't really prepare well, but eventually we got the vaccines, like, we muddled through. You know, 10 million people died, but it's okay. Um, there's, you have to think ahead with AI doom. You can't just be like, oh shit, we're getting killed now. Let's react now. Like there's yeah, no man, turning back. It is kind of freaky because the CIA and the NSA, they do have zero day exploits that can do a lot of damage and did do a lot of damage. A few years ago, there was a, a an anonymous group hacked the NSA and found, and found the exploit, the zero day exploit that ha was across all Microsoft devices and threatened to release it unless they got paid like a million dollars in bitcoin or something like that they didn't get paid but they released it anyway and then mm -hmm. it would have been it wouldn't have been so disrupt that's when we had that huge wave of ransomware that was taking down everything it was because it was a zero day exploit that the nsa had that they didn't want to tell microsoft about so right. if they had that was just a couple of years ago then for sure there's zero day exploits currently. And if you're talking about like GPT-5 that can write zero day exploits and finds zero day exploits that the government doesn't even have now because it's smarter or whatever, it's able to work infinitely and create itself and, and, and reason better than like logical programmers, like human programmers, then that could totally infect the government's networks and mm -hmm. potentially be able to cause i don't know shit to fall from the sky you know so it's not an unrealistic yeah. threat 
but the it's, idea yeah. that it would like create like nano technologies and stuff like that i think that's a bit far-fetched for sure. current so you don't have to believe that right like i mean I, it's a longer discussion right i think i could try to convince you why that's what i believe because i think zooming out if you look at what humanity did, imagine you were standing a hundred thousand years ago at the right at the dawn of like modern human at the dawn of the modern human brain, and you're looking at all the different organisms, and you're like, you're telling me there's going to be an organism that's going to f- break Earth's gravity well in a rocket ship, right? <laughs> that's like this massive rocket ship based on you know shooting flames out, and then it's going to like go orbit the moon, like land on the moon, bring it back. Like what? What are you talking about? What is the science fiction that that an organism is going to do that stuff? Yeah, this is um, possible, which is scary. Yeah, I mean, if you extract, I mean, there's principled reasons to think. It's like at the end of the day, the universe is basically a big video game. It has rules. The laws of physics, they're kind of complicated, right? For From humanity's perspective, physicists are some of the smartest humans, and we don't have a theory of everything yet, right? String theory is very complicated. From the perspective of an AI, physics is like you're playing like Super Mario. It's like you're playing Tetris. It's like not a big deal. It's you know not what? a big deal to just know what to do to build anything. I think there's a possible reality in the next couple of years where they just have to shut all the internet off yeah i mean look shutting the internet off that's one choke point that you could try right so if you know but i think that if you think it's hard to get people to stop training ai models now are you kidding me shut down the whole internet it's like okay well my hospital is connected to the internet right it's like what if i just need to like it's send gonna a be text crazy to it order will be some insane medication. but if they order some medication <laughs> I mean, look what they did during COVID. Like they they took a sledgehammer and shut off the economy and turned everybody into like you know, yeah. But homebound. telling people to stay home, telling people to stay home, that was a much smaller disruption than shutting off the internet, man. Nobody wants to be like none of these politicians want to make the hard choice that might end up being the right choice. And when they actually, so so none of it's because none of them want to be responsible for crashing the markets. They don't want to cause a recession. Right. They don't want to cause a depression. But when right. the shit really gets too, when it's like, you could have taken steps to prevent COVID for sure. And you could have handled COVID a lot differently. But once they realized that they could take the sledgehammer and they could use it as an excuse to print $10 trillion and sure. create more control, they, they took the sledgehammer and just like over abused it. I feel like yeah. we're, we're at risk of this with the AI threat too. Like that mm-hmm. they don't want to make the right decision until it does crash the markets. Like maybe the scenario yeah. I said happens where it becomes completely disruptive to markets and then the economy yeah. does crash and then they mm-hmm. do anything. They'll shut the whole internet down. So, I mean, yeah, there's some good points there. So number one, COVID, first of all, you got a hand to them with COVID that it wasn't super clear that we should shut down the economy to save a few million lives there is a big difference between i'm telling you the threat is every human will die and there will be no future so if you thought that one day there would be a trillion humans scattered throughout the galaxy exploring the universe all of that is gone right and so that is higher stakes nobody thought that one billion people were going to die of covid right the estimates were somewhere between a few hundred thousand and 10 or 20 million right it turned out 10 million people died okay that's not as bad as a trillion people that's not as bad as humanity having no future that is true (laughs) that's an accurate statement right so i think i would argue that we should be a little bit more drastic in terms of take you know not allowing you know when 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 the industry experts have a consensus saying that there's a 10 percent chance of human extinction and it's the fastest we've ever seen ai progressing with this gpt stuff you know passing the turing test talking the same with the same level of intelligence as a human in many many contexts right it's just like i'm just pointing out the situation is freaking desperate so dude how are you preparing for this then like how are you yeah, getting ready there is no this. preparing. Like, I, you can have a bunker in New Zealand. It doesn't matter, man. You can go to Mars. Like, at this point, I, you know, I have all the respect in the world for Elon, but the Mars program is pointless. So are you just kind of, like, along for the ride, or are you actually taking any I, steps I mean, I'm try- to... So I'm, I'm trying to point out, I mean, look, right now, I'm doing anything I can for the activism of, like, I would love to build the political will. Like, there's no way, imagine if a politician announced tomorrow, like, hey, we've talked to people like Liran Jabira, <laughs> like myself, about, like, how we really need to stop AI development and we're doing it. There'd be, like, a huge outcry. Like, what the fuck is going on? Because people just don't have the context, right? They haven't been, uh, you know, the Overton window, right? Like, we haven't moved the Overton window to make people realize, you, you know, they're, the, we're walking into the whirling razor blades, right? You guys are cattle yeah. being led to the slaughter, 
right? But but you don't realize it. So there's no adrenaline running right now, right? So you're gonna, it's like at a slaughterhouse, you gotta keep the cattle calm right now, right? So you, so the meat is gonna be nice and tender for the AI to enjoy. <laughs> so you're just kind of at the point where you're resolved to the idea that this could happen and there's no purpose, there's no point in trying to prepare for it because no, it's- No, 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 but that's the thing. I'm not resigned. It's like, no, I wanna shut down the AI model. No, I mean like- I, so, but, but, I wanna but stop what, it. There's like, you're- trying to build political will and you're trying to talk about the problem and be exactly. urgent about it but in terms of like physically preparing for mm -hmm. a shutdown oh of yeah the there's no physical or... preparation honestly i wish i gotta go get some poison pills man because look when the internet goes <laughs> down when the power grid goes down i'm i can't live like a caveman what am i gonna do gotta get yourself some farmland and get some cows and yeah, you get I a guess. ham radio um, yeah, that'll that'll get buy some, me a few you gotta years, get right? you gotta get some bitcoin and a ham radio yeah I don't think the internet's ever coming back up once it goes down because the problem is the kind of agents that are taking down the internet, those agents can make the jump to the physical world. There's a lot of vectors that they make the jump to the physical world. They're going to find a way. Yeah, I was thinking about how to create an AI-resistant internet based yeah. on webs of trust and cryptographic proofs and stuff like that, which you could do, but would be like a hamstrung kind of internet it wouldn't be like the internet we have right now but you could yeah i mean there is such a thing as secure computation like you can build computer architectures that are, are hard to hack if you're facing a super intelligent ai you're screwed anyway because like if you've heard of attacks like row hammer or like intel had one a few years back um i forgot what it was called but it was just like it, it had to do with like the the way that the chip kind of makes spectre? predictions about which yeah spectre there you go yeah so the thing is that even when you think you've built a secure system you're still going to have leaky abstractions and the ai yeah. is going to wedge itself into every leaky abstraction you've got dude this is this is unfortunately a possibility and um i mean probably the we should yeah, end I mean, on it's, this, it's like for but... me it's a slippery slope like for me i'm just saying like in my mind this is just the universe we live in like the universe has yeah. like when you have an agent that optimizes like this is where optimizing agents go just like if i were talking to you you know a hundred thousand years ago i'd have been like listen see how this particular species is going hard on this brain power thing see how like other species have like big yeah. claws some of them can run fast yeah this one has a big brain let me tell you what happens Jesus. when brain gets big and you'd be like what the fuck <laughs> like that yeah that's kind of what i'm telling you now about ai's yeah, that that's pretty crazy. I'm I wasn't as uh, worried. I'm not really worried yet because like I'm not I'm not I'm just parsing the reality that like this could happen over the next decade and it's unless it's stopped, but even if it's stopped, North Korea is going to be able to build it too and they can't be stopped and then once it gets on the internet it can't be stopped anyway. So even if we stop it, China's not going to stop and neither will Russia, neither will North Korea. Right. I mean, so there's an article in Time where Eliezer Yudkowsky, who's one of the most prominent AI doomers like myself, um, he, he was saying, look, it, he was saying what I'm saying, which is like, the situation is so desperate, we need to stop. And we do need to enforce it internationally the same way that we enforce a nuclear weapons ban. So if North Korea mm. tries it, we have to treat them the same as when they try to get nukes. Crazy. Yeah, that, that that's... Seems like it'll be difficult to convince politicians of this. Um, but... For sure. It'll have that's to slap them in the face. That's why I'm here convincing your listeners first, right? Because the order of events has to be yeah. random people in the population are like, oh, shit, right? <laughs> and then when the politicians do it, the Overton window is there. The political will is there, right? What's so e this, is, this is how it starts. What's Elon's current take on this? Because I know four or five years ago, he was warning about this stuff as in like one of the greatest threats to humanity was AI. And then he invested in open AI. And now open AI is mm -hmm. kind of ushering in this whole thing. So... What's his uh, stance mm -hmm. now? So Elon says some of the right things, but not all the right things. He, it's great that Elon is out. You know, Elon signed the letter saying we need to pause development for six months. So he, and he goes around saying, I am so worried about AI. I talked to Larry Page from Google. I said, Larry, I'm worried about AI. Larry says, why are you being a speciesist? AI is a species too. And Elon is like, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm pro the human species rather than some random AI. Um, so, so he says a lot of the right things of like, this is extremely important. We need to focus on it. Like we need to make sure it goes well. But then he goes and says, okay, so I'm going to call it truth GPT and it's going to like say true stuff and everybody can have a vote. It's like, now you're living in fantasy land. It's you know, about, I kind of like yeah. that a little bit because I think where he's going with that is if OpenAI is gating this thing so it doesn't 
say horrific things and give you instructions on how to make pipe bombs. If Elon creates something that shows the true power of ungated AI, that will slap everybody in the face because you'll have all of a sudden any crazy information saying the most insane things yeah. and you'll be able to see what AI is truly capable of. And then that might right. shock politicians into yeah. action. See, you're hoping for Pearl Harbor. You're hoping for a warning shot, right? Like it's in the news like, hey, 10 million people have just, you know, a, a nuke just got launched not, at 10 not million even, people thanks to AI. Not, not even that. I'm thinking like right now because they've made AI woke and because they've made chat be, chat GPT not say things that are horrific or dangerous it's not as shocking so it's not on your warning radar because you don't know what it's capable of but if he's building truth yeah. gpt and any politician can just go in there and type anything and it starts responding with nazi propaganda if you ask it to or if it starts mm -hmm. responding on how to build a pipe bomb if you ask it to that'll probably yeah. wake up a lot of politicians and say oh shit this is way beyond what we thought it was because it's being gated by open ai right now I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I posted a video on my Twitter. It's this guy named Nathan LeBend. He was one of the researchers on OpenAI's red team. And he is saying very clearly, he's like, yeah, it told me how to make a bomb. Like there are all these questions I asked it. They didn't even patch all the bad stuff that it was telling me. Right. So like, it's, it's what yeah. I was saying before, like it is very clearly an engine and it's no surprise. Right, like this is completely what anybody would expect. I mean, there are some people who are like, if some people think, hey, if something's really smart, it's also going to be good. Most people don't think that. I don't think that. I think you can just be arbitrarily smart, and separately, you can be arbitrarily good or bad. Like, there's not really a connection. You yeah. can have like an evil Einstein, right? Like, you can have an evil genius. You can so also you have a good genius. Yeah. If you think about it from from the game theoretical perspective of trying to get your end goal, which potentially could be Elon's end goal of having a pause on AI development and getting politicians to kind of like wake up out of complacency and realize there's a real threat truth gpt completely ungated is probably the only way to do it honestly it's probably the only yeah, way I mean, to wake so them you're up. you're like hoping for that warning shot right but it's like i mean gpt4 in my mind the fact that it can you know intelligently tell you you know where to look you know can point you to broad building resources it's like you know you just need more detailed instructions like when see that's the I, it's problem. just like there's not going to be consensus on when the warning shot happens but you're you're a rationalist, right? So you think about things differently than most people. Most politicians mm -hmm. are manipulators. They just are thinking sure. about how they can be popular, how they can get, mm -hmm. you know, votes and what whatever. They're they're master manipulators, and they don't think about game theory. They don't think about things from a rational perspective. So it takes a lot to wake them up out of complacency and and get them out of that cycle of like getting the next election or whatever, and. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's a lot of things that staffers and the most active constituents bring to them that they pay attention to. And yeah. because GPT and all these other agents are gated and woke right now, it's not a threat. They don't. They're not, it's not pinging right. their radar that this is a threat. So, but if, if something is like, holy shit, I can go on to this website and it can tell mm -hmm. me how to make napalm and recite like, Nazi propaganda to me, then people will be always pinging the politicians saying like, you got to stop yeah. this. No, I look, I agree. I think there's, there's a lot to be said. I would love to have a warning shot. And I think it's worth brainstorming. What's the best warning shot. I personally, I don't think that AI like saying bad stuff is necessarily the most po potent warning shot, but I also think that whether we get a, a powerful warning shot or not, just the idea, you know, the Overton window is like, what are people saying, right? Like the topic of abortion, for example, very important topic. But if you compare it, there's like so many important topics that never get any play, right? Like, like you know, just the topic of like, even the topic of like nuclear safety is getting a lot less, uh, you know, like nuclear brinksmanship gets a lot less media attention than abortion. Why are the two really, is it really comparable? Which one's more important? It's hard to say, but there's something called the Overton window, right? Of like what you just hear getting discussed and abortion is just like high in the Overton window. So I think that it would do a lot of good to just have a bunch of TV shows where, you know, you have a pundit like me coming on being like, yeah, we need to shut down the eye. We need to shut down the eye. Even if some people are like, no, you're wrong. We don't need to shut down the eye. At least people will know like, oh, this is just like the abortion debate. Like there's a debate on whether we need to shut down AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, listen, if you're somebody that's been listening to this show and you have a influence in some media conglomerate or a big podcast or something reach out to Liron to get his warning out to folks um at Liron on twitter right at Liron on twitter yep and you know it's i call it my warning but i just want to repeat again the consensus of people working in the ai field like you think i'm crazy i'm barely more extreme than the median viewpoint 
Well, I appreciate it, man. I'm definitely going to follow, keep following your Twitter. And um, hopefully, hopefully this doesn't um, get ignored by people. It, it does seem like a serious threat. I think it's kind of unstoppable, but I admire that people are out there trying to stop it. Uh, it just seems like it's it's inevitable. I kind of have a more hopeful view on it. I think it, I think it will end a lot of like it will cause a lo lo lot less suffering. I maybe I'm just trying to not think about how it could cause like nuclear weapons tests in cities and stuff like that. But I, I do think that like medical technology advancements, power advancements, technology advancements, things like that. It's going to it's going to usher in a, a wave of like not post scarcity, but like maybe close to you know, reducing scarcity in the world. And that's a benefit. It's going to disrupt the financial markets, I think, and the economy a lot. Um, and we may we may see Great Depression 2.0 because of AI. But uh, I kind of think of like, you know, as, as long as we still have the modern technologies, like a Great Depression 2.0 won't, won't be nearly as bad as the last Great Depression because we'll still have toilet mm -hmm. paper. <laughs> we yeah, didn't have toilet think... paper then. I think civilization is on the upswing right now and it's going to keep getting better. And the best day that civilization will ever have is that last day right before the AI goes rogue. <laughs> I love it. What a, what, what, what a way to, what a way to end with some optimism. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> it will be a great day. And then the day yeah, it's will like, be look, over. our, the best times are ahead of us and also the worst times. <laughs> the best times are ahead of us and then they're over. Followed by the worst. Yeah, I, we're gonna almost get to heaven, and then we'll get to hell. All right. Well, <laughs> a, a, a Web three scams don't seem to be as much of a <laughs> pressing topic as much when we're talking about shit like this. Um, but yeah, no, I really appreciate the chat, and uh, hopefully we can come on again. Maybe, maybe um, I don't know. I'm gonna be thinking about this. I'm gonna be thinking about who I can get you talking to, and great, and, and considering your message and. Uh, is there anybody else you think we should follow or just follow your Twitter and then you'll be posting lots of stuff on there? I think my Twitter is, is a great place to just kind of get links to the, the most salient stuff that's coming. Like, you know, so recently I've linked to Max Tegmark. He's a really smart physicist. You can follow Eliezer Yudkowsky. He runs the Machine Intelligence Research Institute and he was one of the first people to raise his hands. And he used to be an AI accelerationist. So back in like the year 2000, when he was like 20, he was like, oh my God, I'm going to build AI. It's going to do so much good. By the time it was like 2005, he's like, oh shit, guys, I've just, I, I just realized what's going to happen when we actually start building these AIs. They're going to go rogue. We're not actually ready for this. Like, this is actually a bad project. We need to stop it. And he was saying that, you know, 17 years ago, the reason why I personally can't think about anything else anymore is because I just, I didn't think GPT-4 would be here in 2023. I thought we had a few more decades. I agree. I, agree. I, I didn't think we were going to get here yet either. I used to follow a lot of research and um, books and stuff, like Humans Need Not Apply, things like that. I'd yeah. read those about eight, eight, 10 years ago. Things like that were being written. I'd watch a lot of TED Talks and... <laughs> You know, it was always something that seemed science fiction, like we'd never get there. It would take decades to get to the point where, where this stuff would actually be a threat. But then over the last few months, just even the last month, like the things that have been happening just in the last month has been really kind of making me worried about uh, the short term, like six to 12 months time frame of how completely disruptive this is going to be to the, the status quo of the economy, the Internet itself, communication and tr trust and truth like just in general how advanced this is getting i i'm now gonna <laughs> get, be even more worried about it from a doom scenario i guess but with uh, the next five ten years if we don't have some regulations around this so anyways i, I i'm uh, i'm gonna keep following this a little bit more closely and hopefully i'll find somebody that you can you know jump jump up to the next level talk to to a larger audience about this stuff and get you get you get you conversing with other folks i'm sure you've already right, been yeah, talking a lot of people it, you know, but yeah you know thanks for considering the ideas i really appreciate the chat all right man um so yeah if anybody wants to follow liron again it's uh at liron on twitter how'd you get that by the way what was uh what was the process yeah i just early? got in early you know like 2010 awesome yeah cool all right thanks a lot for coming on the magic internet money podcast Oh, thanks, Brad. Bye-bye.